Hey guys, welcome back to Med School Moose. This is going to be USMLE Step 1 High Yield Images Part 10. Yes, we have finally made it to Part 10. I know it's been a little while since I posted one of the videos in this series. I wanted to take some time to create other content, but we are back with Part 10, and that means there are hundreds of high yield images throughout the video series here. If you haven't checked out the other videos, I will link them right here so that you can be sure to watch them. As always, this information is high yield for USMLE Step 1, as well as Comlex Level 1. And be sure to watch this video to the end because I do have an exciting announcement that will be coming after the content. That being said, let's go ahead and get started. First image here, this one might be a little bit weird to see, but what we're looking at here is basically some hair follicles. And what specifically we're looking at is corkscrew hairs. You kind of see it with this one right here. It's kind of like whirly, like a corkscrew. This is something that is seen in vitamin C deficiency, also known as scurvy. So I do want you to see this corkscrew hair. If you see that, you want to be thinking about vitamin C deficiency. This next image here, we're looking at an eye and we see this abnormal area right here. This is what's called bitot spots. Bitot spots are basically a buildup of keratin on the conjunctiva. As you can see it here, it's kind of a calcified area of keratin. And this is seen with vitamin A deficiency. So the corkscrew hairs, you want to be thinking vitamin C deficiency. These bitot spots on the eyes, you want to be thinking vitamin A deficiency. Next image here, we have a, a lovely arrow sign that's pointing at some structures. And what it's pointing at is zebra bodies. These zebra bodies are basically intralysosomal inclusion bodies. So they're inclusion bodies within the lysosome that are specifically seen within the kidney. And we're seeing some on electron microscopy here. This is seen in Fabry disease. So if you see something like this, it kind of looks like the stripes on a zebra. Really nothing else looks like this. You want to be thinking zebra bodies and you want to be thinking Fabry disease. Next image here, we're taking a look inside the eye at the retina fundoscopic exam. And what this is, is lipema retinalis. This is a buildup of triglycerides in the retinal arteries and veins. You can see that all of these structures look a little bit more thick, a little bit more bolded than they usually would. And that's because of the buildup of triglycerides. This is seen in hypertriglyceridemia, especially in familial disorders. And in that case, the triglyceride levels can be greater than a thousand. They are extremely high and you're getting deposits of triglycerides all over the place. Specifically, one of the places you want to know is within the eye and that causes lipema retinalis. Next image here, this one you should definitely know. It's a very common rash. It is erysipelas. This is a bacterial infection that affects the dermis. It is red, it is very painful. It frequently occurs on the face, as you can see there. And it's typically caused by group A streptococcus. So if you see an image like this, a really red, angry rash frequently occurs on the face, on the cheek. You want to be thinking erysipelas, and you want to be thinking group A streptococcus as the cause. Next image here, this is a look at some microbes, and what we're looking at here is clostridium tetany. This one, the classic appearance, remember clostridium tetany, is a gram-positive, spore-forming, anaerobic bacteria. Really important to know all of those features. Gram-positive, spore-forming, and anaerobic. And the classic description and appearance of clostridium tetany, as you can see on some of these right at the bottom here, it's a tennis racket shape or a drumstick shaped organism. You can see there's kind of like that narrow base with like the wider portion at the top. Tennis racket, drumstick shape. If you see something that looks like that, you want to be thinking clostridium tetany. Next image here, this is another example of some microscopy and we need to be able to identify this as well. This is mycobacterium avium complex, okay? This is an acid fast stain that's showing mycobacterium within macrophages all over the place. They're within all of these macrophages. Remember, this is one of those very common immunocompromised AIDS defining illnesses. You wanna be able to identify this in a patient and you wanna also be able to identify it on histology slides. This next image here, this one is a little bit more difficult, maybe a little bit less common and lower to be tested, but I do wanna make sure that you guys see it. This is an example of Mycobacterium scrofalaceum, okay? This is another type of infection, commonly occurs in kids, typically around one to three years old, that causes cervical lymphadenitis. And you will see that appearing here as a rash on the neck. This is the inflammation of the lymphatic system in that area, the lymph nodes, causing cervical lymphadenitis. And the causative organism for that is Mycobacterium scrofalaceum. Important to know that one, maybe not as testable as something like Mycobacterium avium complex, but if you see the picture, hopefully you can make that association. Next image here, a little bit gross, uh, but this is exactly what it looks like. It's green nail syndrome. You can see the nails are very much green here. Basically what this is, this is a chronic infection of the nail bed that leads to green black discoloration. Very obvious, very easy to identify. The important thing to know here, the most common cause of this, the most common cause of green nail syndrome is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So if you see that, 
If you see any mention of this, if you see a picture of this green nail syndrome, you want to be thinking Pseudomonas. This is another organism that we're going to need to be able to identify. Fortunately, this one, there's really nothing else that looks like this. This is an example of pericoccidioides, okay? This is the organism that, of course, causes pericoccidioidomycosis, and it's so unique in the way that it looks. It kind of looks like a Ferris wheel to me. Basically, what's going on here is that there are daughter cells that are being born asynchronously at different times on multiple areas across the cell surface. So daughter cell here, daughter cell here, daughter cell here. We actually see a second daughter cell budding off of this one here, but they're born asynchronously all around the cell surface, and it kind of gives you that Ferris wheel appearance. Like I said, nothing else looks like this, so if you see it on the exam, you should be able to identify it pretty quickly and move right on to the next question. This image here, this is an example of swarming motility. All right, this one's important to know. This is auger plating, and what we're looking at is swarming motility. It causes a bullseye appearance, and it's concentric rings of growth, kind of like you would see on the inside of a tree trunk. Okay, there's a couple things that are associated with this. If you haven't checked out my USMLE Step 1 Microbiology Buzzwords videos, I would definitely check those out. I'll put a link to that right here as well so that you can watch it. But you want to know this, swarming motility, bullseye appearance on auger plating. That is what that looks like. Next image here, it's yet another microorganism that we're going to need to be able to identify. And this one, you really need to know this because they're going to ask questions about it. It's treponema pallidum. This is the causative organism of syphilis. You're going to get some type of question about syphilis on your exam. Just want you to know the appearance just in case you need to identify it. And yet another organism that we're going to need to be able to identify. This one is Leptospira interrogans, okay? This is an obligate aerobic spirochete. It's a spirochete just like uh, treponema pallidum is, and it has a corkscrew appearance with hooked ends. Why is that important? I'm using both of these pictures because this is how you're going to be able to identify the different spirochetes. Here at the top, we have treponema pallidum or treponema in general. This is the causative organism for syphilis. Here we have Borrelia. As you can see, it's a little bit less of a, sp a spiral shape as compared to treponema. And then finally here, Leptospira has the kind of hooked ends, which makes it really distinctive compared to the other two. So I really want you to be able to identify all those different spirochetes because they are all high yield for the exam. This next picture, this one might be a little bit hard to identify, but what we're looking at here is an example of saber shins. Basically what's going on is there's some anterior bowing of the tibia, really apparent on the left side here. You see how it's kind of bending forward. If you look at another image or if you look at your tibia yourself, you see it's kind of straight down. This one's a little bit more straight, but on the left side here, it's kind of bowing forward. And this is important because this is a seen in multiple conditions, but it's mostly seen in congenital syphilis. So if you see something like this, this is bowing of the tibia. It's called saber shins, and you want to associate that with congenital syphilis. Something else that's really important to know, this is an example of mulberry molars. We have a nice arrow sign here that's showing us what's going on. Basically, this is a defect in the molars that causes a very bumpy appearance, kind of similar to the mulberry fruit. And if you've never seen a mulberry fruit before, this is what it looks like. Got a lot of different bumps on it. It's a very uneven surface, kind of similar to what these molars look like. This is also seen in congenital syphilis. So you want to know both of those examples, saber shins and mulberry molars are things that are seen in congenital syphilis. Really important to know those pictures. Next image here, we are identifying more microorganisms. Guys, histology is super important. I really want to make sure that you guys are able to identify the distinctive features of all of these different organisms. We have yet another arrow sign right here. And the thing that we're looking at is Blastomyces dermatoditis, okay? This is the cause of blastomycosis, which hopefully you guys all know about. But the important thing to know here about the structure is that there's a daughter cell that's from a single broad-based bud. So we see the broad-based bud right here, and then we have a single daughter cell, kind of looks like something like an exclamation point or something like that. But if you see something like this, it's a single daughter cell from a broad-based bud. You want to be thinking Blastomyces dermatoditis, okay? Very important to be able to identify that. Next one here, uh, we have a picture of a patient's scalp with some areas of circular hair loss. This is tinea capitis, okay? This is a ringworm infection of the scalp. This almost occurs exclusively in children. Really want you to know this picture. Tinea capitis, it's a ringworm infection. It occurs almost exclusively in children. Keeping with that, this is a, a circular lesion that's seen elsewhere on the body. This is an example of tinea corporis. This is a ringworm infection of the skin. Tinea capitis infected the scalp. Tinea corporis is affecting the skin elsewhere. 
And as we can see, it is a circular rash with a slightly clearer center. You can see it nice and circular here. And then in the center, it's a little bit less deranged and changed than the rest of the skin. And this is super, super itchy. Really important to be able to identify this, this fungal infection as well. And then to round it out here, this is an example of tinea pedis. This is a ringworm infection that occurs between the toes. We're seeing it right here in between these toes, in between here, and a little bit in between there as well. So this is also known as athlete's foot. I want you to be able to identify all of those different infections. Tinea capitis is a ringworm infection that affects the scalp. Tinea corporis is a ringworm infection that affects some skin elsewhere on the body. And then tinea pedis is a ringworm infection that affects the feet, typically occurring between the toes, also known as athlete's foot. Really important to know all of those. This is going to be the last image here. Of course, we have to end with more microbiology and more organism identification. This is an example of Sporothrix shenkai. This is it in the hyphal form. And basically what this is, it's colonies of conidia, as you can see right here, that are connected by filaments. It kind of looks like little berries on a branch or flowers. And that's convenient because this is, of course, the causative organism for sporotrichosis, which is also known as rose gardener disease or rose handler's disease. And this kind of looks like flowers or little roses on branches here. So really important to be able to identify this and know the causative organism of this as well. Last but not least, I have some super exciting news. I'm going to be doing a giveaway that is starting right here, right now, today. I have partnered with Brainscape, which most of you know I have been using for my own studying for a very long time, and I've been partnering with them for several months as well. I am giving away three six-month passes to Brainscape Pro. This is an amazing tool. If you haven't heard of Brainscape, I'll link the video where I talk about it. It's an amazing tool for space repetition, really great for board exams. I am still using it even today on my emergency medicine boards. So I'm giving away three six-month passes. It is free to enter. All that you have to do is comment your favorite USMLE study tip on one of my YouTube shorts videos. We're going to use one comment per account, so please don't spam with a ton of different comments. The contest is starting at the end of this video, and it's going to run until February 15th, so about two weeks. And then the winners will be announced on the video that is posted the next day on the 16th. All you have to do is leave your favorite USMLE study tip on one of my YouTube shorts videos. I will select three random people to give a six month pass to. And with that, you will also get access to my exclusive USMLE step one prep content. I'm super excited to be doing this. Thank you to Brainscape for your generous donation to make this happen. Go ahead and comment and good luck studying. I will see you in that next video.